Broadcasting. Blog Talk USA. Are you tired of waiting for change? One zero one two. That gives me one thousand two hundred and fifty feet. Texas. Sounds the arrival of the flight from Los Angeles and Chicago. And welcome, everybody, to this, uh, what day is it? It's uh, the Wednesday, uh, March 30th, 2016 edition of T&Z Talk. I am Tony Trippiano, the T in T&Z. He is Richard Zombeck, the Z in T&Z. Of course, a very prominent um, uh, writer. Hey, 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 don't interrupt me. Very prominent okay. writer. It's hump day. For the Huffington Post and for Liberals Unite. And is it hump day or Trump day? It's hump day. And I am okay. here with Tony Trippiano, longtime radio host, professional, aficionado, and um, all around cool dude. Hey. Listen, we've got a guest today, so let me uh, let me just tell everybody in about uh, 15 minutes, we're going to be talking to my dear old friend, Shell Horowitz, who's got a brand new book out, uh, which we'll, uh, we'll get to in about 15 minutes. In, in the meantime, um, I find this really rather fascinating, Z. There's this ongoing debate as to whether or not the media is being overly good to Donald Trump. So the media on all the channels is talking about whether or not they're being overly generous to Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Is exactly. there something about that that you find a little odd? Righteous, righteous indignation. Oh, oh, sweet oh I mean, Jesus. How, how dare they? How dare the other stations say that we're being overly, you know, I mean, there was something interesting today, uh, that um, a couple of the commentators said was that because Ted Cruz, during his interview with with CNN and Anderson Cooper, uh, made some comment about like, yeah, you're giving uh, Donald Trump all this airtime. And Anderson Cooper said, listen, we call you every day to have you on and you keep refusing. And then all the other stations were very quick to say, hey, if the other candidates want to call in, we would have taken their calls. But none of them are calling in. They don't want to talk to us. So, you know. I'll I'll, gi- I'll give them that that there are you know probably Cruz isn't calling in to MSNBC and CNN, uh, but by the same token, uh, you know I, you and I have talked about this that the the press has been complicit in the rise of Donald Trump. I mean I think they calculated one point nine one point nine billion dollars in free airtime for Donald Trump. That's a lot of money. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Um, yeah. You know, President Obama gave a speech a uh, day before yesterday or me. No, it was day before yesterday. And he, he basically, he doesn't slam the media, but he kind of gives them a lesson, uh, which uh, Dan Rather took exception to on Lawrence O'Donnell's show uh, the last word last night, which we're going to get to tomorrow. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, I mean, let's go with the Corey Lewandowski story that broke yesterday that uh, and he was arrested in Jupiter, Florida. And, you know, Donald Trump decided to defend him. And now that's become the biggest story in the news cycle when I believe the biggest story in the news cycle, if we're going to talk Trump, are all of the Washington insiders that are now screaming, crying, and clamoring for attention because world leaders are scared to death of a Donald Trump victory. Well, how is that not a bigger story than his campaign manager manhandling a reporter, which if you watch the video, didn't seem to be all that manhandling. Right. Well, um, I mean, he still he, he still shouldn't have grabbed her. I, I, I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying, how is that a bigger story than world leaders being freaked out over Donald Trump's ascension? Well, yeah. And, you know, we talked about this last week, too, is the the uh, the economists uh, risk assessment uh, has Donald Trump in one of the top 
uh, poll positions for uh, risk to uh, risk to ri- global risks, <laughs> uh. <laughs> along with nuclear war. Donald Trump is one of them. Uh, you know, going going back to what we had started talking about, uh, the head of CBS uh, made a comment to the effect of, I, I understand that Donald Trump is good for the country, but he's good for CBS. So, yeah. you know, we, we kind of know where the media stands on what they're going to do. Uh, you know, it's just, it's all about money, dude. I mean, it's really all about money. Even even if what they were doing meant the end of the world, if they could make an extra three bucks, I think they would. At the same time, can we fault them for their Donald Trump coverage? I mean, can they really be faulted? Should they have ignored him? Uh, should they have applied a set of standards or rules? And I'm just asking the question. I'm not being hypercritical of the media here or defending them in any way. I'm just asking from a devil's advocate standpoint. Should it, should they have been live in studio interviews, uh, which Trump easily could have done because, uh, for those who are not aware, he generally flies back to New York every night because uh, he likes to sleep in his own bed. Uh, which in and of itself is rather odd. But I'm just saying, should they have had a, a set of rules that all candidates need to do adhere to? Well, there there are there are a set of rules in covering candidates, and you can you can find are them in really? almost any journalism. You can find them in a, in almost any journalism textbook. Uh, you know, I mean, this is not rocket science. I mean, one of the things, and again, you know, we'll probably get to that tomorrow. But that Dan rather said is, you know, before an interview, uh, getting your facts straight, doing some research. And, you know, this happens time and time and time again. There's actually a fact checker who gave up uh, fact checking Donald Trump because it was just too much work. I mean, it was just it was overwhelming to fact check him uh, to the degree that he needs to be fact checked. And Lawrence O'Donnell actually suggested that we have a ticker next to a Donald Trump interview that says lie, 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 untruth, untruth. And the th- I mean, you've probably had this happen. I certainly have. I'm watching an interview with someone and they ask the person a question and the person being interviewed makes this wild statement that is factually incorrect. And I go, wait a minute, that's that's not true. And you wait for the interviewer to 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 say something, to ask a follow up question to uh, call him out or her out and there's nothing and I'm left with the question of well either they they didn't do their research they don't know the actual facts or they simply don't care and you know know, one of the things that one of the things that Obama said one of the things that Obama said during that event too was like there's more to journalism than just handing someone a microphone Right, which which in and of itself was an absolute uh, uh, truth. You know, it, it it's interesting. Uh, when I was a publicist um, some years back, I owned a PR firm, Z, and and there were were a handful of papers, uh, newspapers around the country, that would often uh, print some of my stuff, and they actually had independent fact checkers that worked for the paper that would call me just to confirm certain things like the spelling of my client's name or the contact phone number, etc. Those people don't have jobs anymore. Uh, They don't have, uh, most news uh, outlets don't have fact checkers any longer, Uh, you know, because of downsizing. uh, And in fact, we had a downsizing event in Detroit yesterday where three uh, very popular on-air television uh, folks were uh, shown the door uh, because of a cost-cutting move. And so, you know, we we take a look at journalism the way it used to be, the way I was taught it, which was in the 1980s. I'm not afraid to admit that. And uh, I don't know how it's taught today. Uh, except for maybe every man and woman for themselves. Uh, but this idea that uh, we have, you know, the AP style book and there is the, um, what is the, the ethics and journalism organization, the name escapes me, 
Uh, the official name escapes me right now. I mean, it's not that that rules don't exist, my friend. It's just they don't seem to be followed anymore. Well, they, they don't apply. And the other issue is I, I recently wrote an article um, – Last week on on Friday about uh, you know the, the basically the premise of the article was the difference between blogging and podcasting right brilliant and stuff by the way brilliant stuff thank you for thank thank you for it's still on the front page of of media by the way of the media section of the Huff Post um, and has been for the past four days but but my my point is and part of part of the point that I made in the article is that there was there was a writer who decided to try an experiment. He, he wrote one article that was very well sourced uh, with fact checking and backlinks and links to his opinions and, and all that, which takes a lot of time. I can tell you a good article can take one to two days um, once you finally collected your, your facts and formed your opinion. And then he wrote another article basically calling Amy Schumer a racist. And he put them both out there and, you know, I don't think we need to go into and start guessing which one did better and which one made him money. Uh, the first one, which was a really good article, uh, was read by the people he emailed it to. And the Amy Schumer article made it onto Salon, and he probably got a couple hundred bucks for it. Huh. And it and it took him 10 minutes to write. So, no. you know, that, that that's where we are. The incentives are Very quickly, because... Our guest is on the line, but, you know, let me just share with you. There was a regular, when I was doing the morning show, uh, I had a regular guest by the name of Chad Solweski. Chad is an award-winning journalist. Uh, and when I say award-winning, he has won you know, a couple dozen writing awards. Um, <clears throat> last year, at about this time, he resigned from the newspaper that he worked for. Because it had become, his job had become writing for the web. And so he was expected to write four or five stories a day for mm -hmm. the website. Well, this just kind of confirms what you were just saying. You know, you can write, a, a good writer, let me, let me rephrase that, a fast typist who has some writing ability can easily do four or five stories a day that are three to 600 words, right? Uh, doesn't necessarily make it right, doesn't necessarily make it interesting, but in a day and age when we're pushing information out as quickly as we possibly can, for a journalist, for a true award-winning journalist, imagine the frustration. So he therefore had enough time to retire, so he did. Yeah, it's it's painful. And they ended up losing a really great writer. But, you know, it is what it is. Anyway, our guest is with us. So, let me um let me get to let me get to him cuz he's a, a an old friend, somebody that I love dearly, someone that I have a ton of respect for. And um, excited to have him on the show. He's got a brand new book out, which we're going to uh, talk about uh, at length today. <laughs> but uh, first of all, an introduction is in order. Joining us now is Shell Horowitz. Uh, Shell, for well over a decade, uh, has been um, considered what's called a transformpreneur. I actually was able to say that without stuttering has been showing business owners how to be more profitable by being green and, uh-oh, is he ready for this? Ethical. Shell oh. shows uh, businesses, yeah, I can imagine that. Shell shows businesses <laughs> how to go green affordably and effectively and how to make the green commitment to win new customers, uh, turn those customers into fans, and turn those fans into ambassadors. Recently, he focused on the profit motive as a powerful tool for turning hunger and poverty into sufficiency, war into peace, and catastrophic climate change into planetary balance. Shell is an international speaker, transformational business consultant, and the multiple award-winning author of 10 books, including the long-running category bestseller, Guerrilla Marketing Goes Green, and the brand new Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World, which he's here to talk uh, to us about today. 
Uh, and so if you want more information, I'm going to spell it for you. T-R-A-N-S-F-O-R-M-P-R-E-N-U-E-R.com. My good friend, Shell Horowitz, welcome to TNZ Talk. It's a pleasure to have you with us this morning, and congratulations on the new book. Thank you so much, Tony. Yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, you know, you mentioned at the end of your intro there that I've been looking at how to turn poverty and hunger into sufficiency, war into peace, and catastrophic climate change into planetary balance. And the interesting thing is we actually know how to do these things. Uh, people like they say, oh, it's so big, it's so scary. But the reality is we've made enormous progress on all of these things in the last 20 years or so, and we will continue to make more. So it's a very exciting time to do this work. It's a very exciting time to uh, create this book and this brand of Transformpreneur. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here with you and sharing it. And I would ask that you tell me the name of your co-host there, because I don't know it is Richard I'm, I'm Zombeck. Rich, Richard, Richard is a, a writer for the Huffington Post and for Liberals Unite. And certainly you're going to find a very friendly audience, uh, not only our audience, but amongst uh, Richard Zombeck and myself. So let me, let me ask you, you've, you've got 10 best-selling books out there. Uh, I consider you a transformational uh, marketer. Uh, you are a consummate communicator. Where did the idea for guerrilla marketing to heal the world come from? It really started in 1999 when I was very, very active. I actually founded an organization called Save the Mountain. I'm looking out my window at Mount Holyoke, uh, Joseph Skinner State Park in Massachusetts, and just north of that state park was another mountain that was privately owned where a developer decided that he was going to put 40 McMansions up all the way to the ridge line, visible from the state park. And while all the experts were wringing their hands and saying, oh, this is terrible, but there's nothing we can do, I went out and organized a movement and stopped the thing. And uh, I thought it would take us five years. I knew we would win. I had total confidence that we would win. But it only took... 13 months. So a year and a month into the campaign, that land was protected forever. That got me thinking about how could I use my activism as well as my marketing in my career. And then I started looking at, this was right around the time when the, the round of early 2000s business scandals were exploding like Enron and WorldCom. And I came to the idea that all the methods that I'd been advocating for decades about how to market frugally and effectively also turned out to be quite ethical. So that led me talking about business ethics as a success strategy and incorporated into that was the idea of going green because I don't think you can be ethical if you're not green. And then from there, it just kept expanding and expanding until in the last two years, I came up with this idea that really business should be taking a much more active role in solving the biggest problems of our time. And the way to do that is not through guilt and shaming them, but by showing them they can make money doing it. So it's, it's amazing to me to be in this position, to, to be sharing this message, to be having people paying attention and listening. I've been in the green world so long, well before it was fashionable. And it's really nice to see that it's become mainstream. Well, and, and you know, be, beyond that it's become mainstream, it is uh, even even the most uh, dyed-in-the-wool uh, corporate uh, uh, polluters are beginning to understand that it has to be more than just a facade, that going green has to be more than just a marketing campaign. And, in fact, in, in, I just read in the local paper, the Detroit Free Press, uh, two days ago uh, that uh, the Detroit Edison is going to actually put a 10-acre solar farm up in the city of Detroit. Uh, they wouldn't have done that five years ago, Shell. And, you know, so there is an example, and I don't know, maybe we could even say uh, that some companies, some corporations have been shamed into doing the right thing, but, you know, you make a profound point. Uh, it's profitable. And at the end of the day, if you are a corporate citizen, you need profit. Sure, absolutely. And it is true that, you know, there are examples like Nike, for example, that, that did, was doing things very wrong around sweatshop labor 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And they were at least part of their motivation 
for improving that was, I think, shame. But now, if you look at what they've been up to lately, they're really quite committed. And I think most companies that they may get into this out of timidity or out of a desire to avoid bad headlines or whatever, but they very quickly realize that they're doing good work in the world and they shouldn't be afraid to brag on it. Uh, my friend Joel McCower, who works at greenbiz.com, he says a lot of companies are still ashamed to talk about the good things they're doing in the environment, too worried about being called greenwashers. But the best defense against an accusation is truth. So if you can show people that it's more than greenwashing, that it's real. Um, and there are companies, I, uh, a certain chemical giant that makes Roundup and other products comes to mind as a company that likes to claim things in its operating history are green when they're emphatically not. So we do have to be on our guard against people not telling the truth. Uh, about people making claims that really have no basis in reality. Um, nuclear power is another great example of a whole industry that, that claims to be environmentally friendly when we all know after Chernobyl and Fukushima that it's not even close. Um, so, but, you know, the companies that are good doing good things, they should brag. They should be using this in their marketing, and many of the smart ones are. Companies like Ben & Jerry's, for example. And interestingly enough, Ben & Jerry's parent company, Unilever, is the largest company ever to undertake B Corp certification, which they've just started that process. It's probably going to take them four or five years because they're so big and complex. They're one of the largest consumer package products companies in the world. So that's good. it's going to be quite a few years before we're going to be actually able to to say, oh, here is this Fortune 50 company that is a B Corp, uh, Benefit Corporation, which is an, a legal form that allows companies to put factors other than short-term profit into consideration, uh, because the traditional corporation is legally bound to seek those short-term profits at the expense of everything else, which is not a very healthy model. So, Shell, this... Go ahead, Z. Richard here. Um, I I actually know the area in Holyoke that you're talking about. Um, I'm from Massachusetts. I grew up in Massachusetts, um, so I I know that. Uh, so I'm I'm curious about uh, your your strategy and your approach uh, with some of these corporations. I mean, I I do I do find it. I've I've always found it fascinating. And Tony and I were talking about this earlier in the show. Is that you know if the end of the world were coming and they could still make three bucks by destroying it, they would. Uh, so and you know maybe that's a that's a naive uh view uh but what what how how do you approach these companies and get them to kind of look at this and take it seriously well <laughs> You hit on a good point because there are certainly companies that do act that way. And so if they think they can make three bucks destroying the world, we need to show them how they can make four or five or ten by preserving it. It's that simple. So just as an example of what's possible, think about I, – I know of at least three companies, and I talk about some of them in the book, that are making solar-powered LED lanterns. And you say, so what? Well, here's the so what. They're selling them to people who have kerosene lanterns or who have darkness in you know various countries in Africa and Asia where the median income is ridiculously tiny and uh, the problems of kerosene lamps which include severe fire hazards toxic fumes lousy light and a lot of other stuff um, they're going in there and for the same two dollars a month let's just say that they've been paying for kerosene the family's making payments on a lantern and after ten months they own it free and clear they've got a twenty dollar lantern that never needs any more fuel that is saving them immediately $2 a month, and if their income is 20 or $30 a month, that's a significant increase in their buying power. Uh, it's giving better quality of light and longer-lasting lights so that this family, maybe they've been working in the fields all day, maybe they can come home and do two or three hours of a cottage industry and, and make some spare cash that way. Maybe their kids can see well enough to do better on their homework, get better grades in school, get a better job when they get out. This $20 lantern is a ladder out of poverty. That's the sort of opportunity that we're talking about. I, 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 I get that, and I understand that, and um, I, I guess um, I'm trying to I'm trying to phrase this in a way that doesn't sound callous, but I'm I'm curious in in like more 
more, you know, you mentioned Ben and Jerry's and in the larger country where we've companies that are making billions and billions and billions of dollars off off of, uh, you know, basically not caring. How how do you how do you transition them into an awareness of of this this kind of really crucial uh, situation that we're in? You let them do it themselves. You look at companies like General Electric, General Motors, Walmart, and the amazing things that they've been doing, the amazing money they've been making doing the right thing. It becomes not possible to justify doing the wrong thing if the right thing is so profitable. Um, let me just, um, I'm going to flip quickly to a section of the book where I have both GE and GM on the same page, I think, here. Okay, here we go. General Electric created $25 billion in new revenue, I'm quoting from the book here, from $2 billion invested in sustainability and innovation research. That's a 1,250% return on investment, by the way. Uh, Walmart took just one thing that Walmart has done. Walmart has actually done many, many things to green its operations because, and Walmart is about as bottom line driven company as you can think of, but they realized very early on under at least Scott's CEO ship that they were able to save money and make money by going green. So just one of the things they've done, they've diverting waste from landfills. It was already saving the company $231 million a year by 2012. But they've also, they opened up a whole new market for organic foods, and the market they opened up essentially doubled the market. They're selling about $15.44 billion in organics. And the interesting thing, Richard, is they're selling it to people who, by and large, have never set foot in a Whole Foods, don't know what the inside of a Whole Foods looks like. It's a completely new market. GM is making a billion dollars a year in revenue on stuff they used to throw away. Uh, Marks and Spencer, the British department store, was so successful when they started measuring a hundred different metrics of sustainability and watching what making actions on those hundred was doing for their bottom line that they doubled it. They're now monitoring 200. And they have a ticker on their homepage that will tell you at any moment exactly how they're doing on all of those metrics. So over and over again, these are large, major corporations. These are not, you know, tiny little outfits like me. Um, and over and over again, they find that doing the right thing is highly profitable, saves money, builds revenue. Hard to argue with that. Yeah, our, well, our guest so, again, Shell Horowitz. Hold, hold on there, Z. Our guest again is Shell Horowitz. He's <laughs> the co-author of a new book, and uh, I should mention his co-author is oh, a little guy that some people might might know, Jay Conrad Levinson. Uh, but the book is Guerrilla Marketing to Heal the World. Z, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, what, yeah, and I should yeah. mention that Jay is deceased, and therefore this is probably going to be one of the last books to come out with his byline on it. But he founded the Guerrilla Marketing brand back in 1984. Yeah, I actually, I think I read some of his some of his stuff and um, was, was looking. Where, where can um, where can we find your book? Because I was looking for it yesterday, actually. Okay. Well, it is not officially out until April 19th. Ah, uh, okay. You can get advanced copies directly through me at transformpreneur.com. So that's the word transform and then the second half of the word entrepreneur. And uh, you can also pre-order it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Chapters Indigo, uh, several other major booksellers, as well as uh, all the independent bookstores, which we love independent bookstores. I'm actually doing my first bookstore event at a local independent bookstore. Richard, if you know the area, it's the Odyssey in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Yeah, terrific. Terrific. So, so I, I had a, I had a quick question because uh, you had mentioned the, the, the food, and France recently uh, passed a law uh, for supermarkets, uh, basically that they they can't just throw out food, and um, Starbucks has started a recent a recent initiative, which I I kind of think is more PR than anything else. But I I kind of wanted to get your take on that. Well, what is their initiative? What the, I don't I can't comment on it because you haven't told me what it is. Oh, uh, 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 Starbucks is actually just going to be donating any kind of food that they would normally be throwing out at the end of the day. Okay. Well, we have a big problem with food waste in the U.S. You cannot tell me that we have a hunger problem. What we have is a food distribution problem because fully one third of our food is being thrown away. So anything that reduces that, that puts that food in the mouths of hungry people, I think is a good thing. 
Um, in general, we need to be much more of a zero-waste culture. We need to figure out how to live every aspect of our lives in ways that we're closing the loops, reusing the things we used to throw away, um, keeping things where they're needed as opposed to off, offing them to landfills or, or sending them to the third world to be taken apart and put back together in, in a place where they don't care about the toxic fumes that are happening. So it, all of this stuff is deeply connected. And interestingly enough, zero waste, you know, we have had a huge housing boom in this country starting around 1980. And if we had built all of those units sustainably, we would probably be much farther along on the road to compliance with the Paris Accords. We would have a lot less carbon footprint than we have now. We'd be using a lot less petroleum and coal and nuclear than we are now. We'd probably have transitioned entirely to a, uh, a renewable energy economy. And the, the way that I'm able to say that is that I look at one house built back in 1983 by a genius named Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute. Now, Amory lives in Old Snowmass, Colorado, which is a suburb of Aspen. Richard, you probably know what Aspen's greatest industry is. Uh, actually, actually, I don't. I don't. Okay, Tony, how about you? Um, eh. Try your, your, your turn. Your turn. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, what do you need for skiing? Well, you need snow, you need weather, you need skis, and you need equipment, you need clothing. What do you need for that snow? Uh, cold weather. Yep, bingo. Okay. So, <laughs> here is a guy building a house in a place whose entire industry is built around having cold weather, right? He doesn't have a furnace in his house. His house is warm enough that not only doesn't he need a furnace, he's growing bananas in his house. 1983. It has essentially no energy out input from the grid. You know, it's so small as, as to be insignificant. When I heard him speak, he talked about his $5 a month electric bill. And this is, by the way, a luxurious 4,000 square foot house. This is not a little shack somewhere. Um, so he, there he is in Aspen, Colorado, with a house that doesn't need a furnace and grows bananas and is 4,000 square feet of luxury living, and it's net zero, and he built it in 1983. So we've known how to do this for 34 years, at least. Then why, have, uh, why has this been largely ignored except for lefties like you and I and Z? <laughs> Because a lot of people are short-sighted and they only look at the obvious and they don't look at the non-obvious parts of the equation. They don't look at whole lifestyle costs, for example. This is the only way that nuclear is ever able to pretend to be competitive with even fossil fuels, let alone uh, alternative energy, um, because nobody's looking at that whole life cycle. Nobody's looking at the deep carbon costs of uranium mining and milling and, and processing and all that and transporting the stuff around the country. All of this stuff has a carbon footprint, it has an energy cost, and we haven't been looking holistically at it. When you take any one slice of something, you're not seeing the whole picture. But our entire economic prognoses have been based on these little slices and not looking at the whole thing. When you look at the whole thing, a lot of stuff changes. And you realize, for one thing, that our biggest energy resource is what Amory Levins, the guy who built that house, called megawatts and megabarrels, conservation. And let's take a really famous example. Okay, there's a certain tall skyscraper in New York you've probably heard of. It's called the Empire State Building. Um, and the Empire State Building was built in 1931 when gas and oil were basically close to free. Um, it was, I, I've seen the number of what it costs for a barrel of oil there. It's less than we pay for a gallon, even in today's uh, gasoline depressed prices. It, it was unbelievably cheap. So, the, the cost of, a, of literally a couple of pennies for a gallon of oil was not a significant factor. So they didn't build that building with conservation in mind, as you can imagine. Um, they built it to put a lot of people back to work in 1931 during the Depression and to be able to claim the status of having at the time the tallest building of the world, and they kept that status for several decades, actually. But a few years ago, Lovins and some other groups got together and did what's called a deep energy retrofit of the Empire State Building. It wasn't cheap. It was a $13 million project. But that project has been saving them 4.4 4 
million dollars every year. That, my friend, is a 33% ROI. You know, I don't get 33% on my investments. Um, this is economic sense. This is just something we, we ought to have been doing for decades. And, you know, if they can do it from a building like that that was so not built to work with the earth, then those of us who live in, you know, more appropriately designed homes and work in, in buildings, why don't we be doing this thing? Our roofs are an energy source and a source of food that we're not harvesting very much. Um, I actually have a video. I made a five-minute video interviewing the manager of a farm in the South Bronx, eight stories above the South Bronx, on a rooftop, growing the most beautiful kale and bok choy that you've ever seen. So, Shell, um, two winters ago, I watched uh, a sitting senator walk into the Senate and throw a snowball on the floor, <laughs> proving that there was no such thing as climate change. Proving nothing and, of the ex- I know. <laughs> I, I was being sarcastic. Um, how, how, do you, how do you get to those people and to the people that believe him? Because there, there are a lot of people. I come across a lot of people that tell me that there's no such thing as climate change, and and I understand that. You know, I mean, the the corporations and what and what they're doing, and we're seeing that more and more uh, with them taking uh, an active role in this and starting to change things. But how do you how do you get to uh, people who just fundamentally uh, deny science, or do you just kind of let them deny it and move on with with uh, the, well, the, it, the it task at hand? Well, it depends to some degree on who they are. You know, if they're uh, Charles Koch and they ha- actually have a platform, or they're Alex Epstein who wrote the, uh, the totally flawed book, um, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, you want to rebut them. You want to say, look out the window, open your eyes. <laughs> Can you really tell me that since, what is it, since 2005, we had the Asian t- tsunami, we had Katrina, we had Sandy, we had Irene. Um, you know, here in Massachusetts, we basically had a zero snow winter, which I have lived here 34 years, and I don't ever remember a winter with this little snow, a winter that was this warm. It was actually rather nice for me as I go hiking every day. Um, that, that there were only, uh, really, there was only one week that it was around 20. Uh, but um, the climate is definitely changing. And what we really need to look at is what are the impacts of not, let's put it this way, okay? Let's say the climate deniers are right and the climate warriors are wrong. And we go ahead and listen to the climate warriors anyway, and we fix things so that we're using 100% renewables, and we get off fossil fuels, and we're not breathing the toxic air from coal plants, and our medical bills go down, and all the rest of it. Is that really so terrible? <laughs> but the reality is that every, you know, pretty much every legitimate scientist says that this is a real problem, it's human cause, and we're running out of time to deal with it, and what the hell are we waiting for? If 40 years ago when we knew this was coming, we planned for it better, we wouldn't be in crisis now. And, you know, even a few years ago, even Republicans believed in climate change. They take the party line from the people who fund them, and they've changed their tune. But this is not strictly a Democratic Party issue. This is not strictly a left-wing issue. The health issues alone are a way that we can reach people. They may not believe in climate change, but they know their kid has asthma. You know, they may not believe in climate change, but they know that the soil that they've been farming for 50 years with chemical methods is suddenly much less productive. All of these patterns are there for the taking. You know, and it's something that uh, Richard Zombeck and I have talked about, Shell. You know, people might, uh, you know, clamor against socialism, yet they carry a social security card. You know, uh, reconcile. Yeah, and they drive on the interstate highway and they send their kid to public school, maybe, and they they have the benefits of the police, fire, and sanitation departments that are publicly funded. Um, One of the interesting things that's happened this year is I think that Bernie Sanders is de demonizing the S word. Because what can you do? You can't attack somebody as a socialist if he says, yeah, I'm a socialist, proud of it. And uh, I rather like the way that in Sweden or in Denmark that, that. Health care is a right, that education is a right, and uh, it, it kind of takes the wind out of the opponent's sails. 
Oh, they can't say how horrible you're a socialist. And they'll say, yeah, I'm a socialist. That's why people are voting for me. You know, Shell, we, we, we don't have a lot of time, and I have a lot of questions. Let me uh, start with asking you to share with the audience uh, what the magic triangle is. And it's not just a clever phrase. It actually does represent something fairly profound. I'm sorry, Tony, it broke up right when you were telling me what the phrase was. The magic triangle. The magic triangle. Okay. Yeah, this is honesty, integrity, and quality. And it's something that I use in evaluating what businesses I do business with and how I run my own business. Um, it, and it becomes, again, a marketing advantage. It's kind of shameful that we live in a world where doing the right thing becomes a marketing advantage because people are not used to it. Um, so... For me, I will turn down a client if it doesn't come under my criteria of behaving with honesty, integrity, and quality. And that might mean I've turned down work uh, to promote, say, a book that I, I didn't feel was a good enough book, if the quality is lacking. Um, you know, honesty, I talked about Alex Epstein and his book uh, about the moral case for fossil fuels. There is honesty significantly lacking in that book. There are assumptions made that are not based in fact. And when I reviewed that book in my monthly column, uh, you know, I talked about those things. I, I talked about the, the fallacies that he was asking us to believe. Um, if I don't want to do business with a company that I know is cheating people. And it just comes back to how do you want to be treated? And even more, how do the people that you're working with want to be treated? You know, Shell, if, if somebody were to, if somebody were to pick up just the the chapter outline of the book. There, there are certain things where they would read them and go, really? Uh, and, and let me give some examples. It's not about transactions. It's about relationships. Uh, really? Uh, and, you know, we, we, you know and another one might be uh, the learning possibilities of failure. Well, this sounds, you know, like convenient pie in the sky, uh, pie in the sky stuff. And uh, you know, some would say, okay, but it, is there really an application to what Shell Horowitz and, uh, and, and and Jay Conrad Levinson wrote here, or is this just clever a turning of phrases to appeal to an audience? And I, of course, could make an argument easily against this, but uh, just to appeal to a, a, an audience that n that wants this message, doesn't need it, wants the message. Yeah, well, let me take this one at a time. Uh, there is actually, I, I can make available for free, um, the chapter outline, the index, the endorsements, and a few excerpts from the book. Um, just jot me a note, S-H-E-L, at greenandprofitable.com and say, um, give me the gorilla sampler, and I will send that out. Um, so, you know, the learning possibilities of failure, I go back to Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison took 10,000 tries to develop a light bulb. Most people would say he failed 9,999 times. He said, I didn't fail. It was a 10,000-step process. <laughs> so it's all in your attitude. Um, and what was the other one you read out? Uh, the learning possibilities of failure, and it's here somewhere. Uh, uh, well, here let's 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 just go with this one. Turn your comp your competitors into allies. Okay. Well, I love this, and this is something that actually very big companies understand. Do you ever wonder why the post office, which is that we you know we all grew up laughing at the post office and its inability to find a letter, and yet it somehow offers express mail. And Express Mail, they're going to give the money back if it's not there in 24 hours, right? Well, here's how they do that. They partnered with a certain other company that is known for its expertise in logistics and for knowing at all times where something is in its system. And FedEx brings Express Mail and Priority Mail airport to airport for the post office. FedEx is flying fuller planes and getting paid for them. The USPS is not sitting around issuing refunds all day. Uh, you know, so here we have a situation where two fierce competitors partnered to do something better. Another example would be back in the 90s, uh, many, many computers from both IBM and Apple were powered by something called the PowerPC chip. It was about the same era as the Pentium. 
And this was a partnership of IBM, Apple, and Motorola. Now, you know, IBM and Apple spent a lot of time and energy uh, <laughs> creating ads about why you shouldn't buy from one and should buy from the other. But the reality is they'll work together when it makes sense. Many, many car companies have partnered. My very first car that I bought new instead of used was an 88 Chevy Nova designed by Toyota and essentially identical to the Toyota Corolla, but $2,000 cheaper for me, and I was able to say I bought a car made in America. All right. Well, <clears throat> that works. Uh, that works perfectly. Z, uh, do you got a question? Uh, I I don't. Uh, I'm I'm uh, waiting for the book to come out. All right. Well, um, I thought I sent you a copy of the book, but uh, if not, I will uh, anyway. I, I I've, let me shall for the sake of argument um define green in the world of uh this book and uh is it any different than any other definition of green well it's a, there are a hundred definitions of green so some of them will fit this and some of them won't but to me it's products and services that work in harmony with the environment and to make it better uh, and then extending from that into the social transformation piece would be products and services that help address things like climate change, like war, like poverty, uh, in ways that are meaningful and profitable. And the book has lots and lots of examples of how to do this, ranging from one-person solopreneur businesses like me up into some of these giant brands that we've been discussing today. Uh, two more questions. I'm going to start with a smaller one, and then I'm going to give you the whopper. Uh, don't worry, it's not that scary. But the smaller one, one of the chapters is titled Iceland's Renewable Energy System Applying the Abundance Model to a Whole Country. I was not unfamiliar with this when I read it. Uh, but I certainly believe that as people make a decision whether or not they want to buy this book, that that really is, to me, a pristine example of how something works at a global level, if you will, Shell? Yeah, Iceland is actually, even though it's an island country out in the middle of nowhere in the ocean where its nearest neighbor is Greenland, Iceland is actually importing, uh, sorry, exporting energy to mainland Europe. And Iceland is blessed with incredible geothermal and hydro resources. Geothermal means something very different in Iceland than it does in the United States. In the United States, typically, it means you dig a hole until you find 50-degree temperatures all year round, and you use that to heat air or water in the winter and cool it in the summer. In Iceland, it means you're going into something that's roughly 200 degrees Fahrenheit, just barely below boiling. It's hotter than hell. It's volcanic. It's actively volcanic. Um, they had a big eruption a few years ago. You might remember it closed all of Europe's airways. Um, and uh, they also have great hydro resources. So geothermal in Iceland means you're, you're digging into this hot volcano and you're using that to heat an entire community at a time. So like every single town we went to in Iceland had a municipal swimming park with geothermally heated pools on up to, I think the top one was like 45 degrees Celsius. That is pretty darn hot. Um, um, you know, 50 degrees Celsius is roughly 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, no, sorry, 40 degrees, I think, is roughly 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are really hot water pools, and everybody goes swimming in Iceland every day. They all go to the, the water parks and, and sit in these hot, hot, hot water tubs. Yeah, the sulfur and, baths. Yeah. You know, so every every single person in Iceland is a beneficiary of a renewable energy policy. Pretty much the only fossil fuels they use are for vehicles. All right. Uh, now the Whopper question before we let you go. And of course, we will remind the audience uh, come mid-April that the book is available and where they can get it. We will not let them forget that. But the, the big question... The order right now. Right. Uh, and we'll give you a chance to repeat all that information before we let you go. But the big question is, guerrilla marketing to heal the world. Really? Heal the world, Shell Horowitz? Yes, really. You know, we talked about D-Light before, where a $20 lantern becomes a, a leg up on poverty. Uh, there are many, many examples in the book 
about how creative products and services are really making a difference in people's lives. There are, my friend Yannick Silver has a guest essay in which he talks about 11 different models where businesses can uh, interact with charities, uh, 11 different ways. And, and just from the, the obvious ones that we've all heard about, like Tom's shoes, on up to some much less well-known, uh, there's the whole idea of looking at, at peace, okay? Peace is probably the hardest one of those big four to work with. And why? Because peace involves people who don't agree with each other sitting down and listening and talking and learning to get to know each other as people. And that can be a very scary thing for people, especially those who have some sort of investment in maintaining differences. But ultimately, the vast majority of wars either are or started as resource issue conflicts. So if you solve the problems of who has enough water and who doesn't and who has enough land and who doesn't and who has enough energy and who doesn't, a lot of that other stuff starts to go away. You still have the religious and ethnic conflicts, but you no longer have the basis that created them. And over time, if you can get people talking to each other, learning together, some amazing things have been happening, for example, in Israel and Palestine. Very tiny little movements of Israelis and Arabs working together in very powerful ways. You saw what happened in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland used to be one of the, country, the world's scariest war zones. I was in Ireland and Northern Ireland in 2012 and the first four or five times I crossed the border I didn't even see it uh, I finally one day I said okay I'm going to look at where the border is and okay sure enough okay there's some flags and a sign saying uh, you just crossed over please switch to miles instead of kilometers and that was it that was the border all right, all right. well I happen there it can happen in South Africa you know South Africa horribly racist regime into the 90s, decades and decades of oppression, and they totally turned it around. Is there an absence, complete absence of prejudice there? Of course not. But are people living together in peace? Yes. Well, I'm going well, to... Absolutely. Well, I'm going to suggest one of the shorter chapters in the book is towards the end of the book, and it's worth the price in and of itself, and it's titled Profit by Helping the World. And I'm just going to leave it there. That'll be my big teaser, Shell Horowitz. Uh, and people are going to have to wait until April 19th to read it. But it's worth the price of admission in and of itself for that, I don't know, seven pages, uh, which is just absolutely full of, uh, I think, affirmation and con and confirmation. Let's remind everybody, Shell, before we let you go this morning, again, where the book is available for pre-order. Okay, at any place that you can normally get a book. Um, that would include Amazon. That would include your local independence. It would include BarnesandNoble.com. Um, of course, you can, if you'd like to get one autographed, then you have to get it from me, and you go to transformpreneur.com, you um, are, and you, you click on the book cover, and that'll take you to a page on one of my other sites where there's all the full ordering information. Uh, there also there will be a bonus package with it. I'm still working out some of the details, but I can tell you it's got a really cool package from the brilliant marketer Sam Horn. It's got some uh, other very, very cool things, um, some things from me, including some actual time with me to help look at your, um, your own needs and possibilities with socially conscious, transformational, environmentally friendly business. So it's uh, it's not an expensive book, and it, it's got a tremendous value, and it's it's all twenty four ninety five list price. So um, I, I agree with you. It's a book the most worth reading. <laughs> well, of course you agree with me. You better agree with me. Dang it. Uh, my good friend, Shell Horowitz. Uh, Z, let me give you a chance to uh, wrap it up for for you, and then I'll throw in my two cents worth. No, it was a it was a pleasure talking to you, Shell, and I look I look forward to it. Thank thanks for coming on. And I look forward to getting to know you better. Well, Shell, as always, my friend, and you are my friend, and I, I said that up front, and I'll say it again. Uh, you're brilliant. You're kind. You're gentle. You're compassionate. Uh, and you know what? You're the real deal. Um, and everything you said is based in reality. Uh, everything you write about is certainly uh, based in thorough 
uh, research and what people don't know is that oftentimes and many times uh, you don't just write about what you've heard. You go witness it first and then you write about it. Uh, when we talk about ethics, you are the epitome of ethics and always have been. I've been blessed to know you for many years now, and hopefully we have got many more in front of us, my friend. Hopefully. Thanks so much for having me on, Tony. That's fine. We'll have you back once the book is out and give us a chance uh, to talk once Z has had a chance to read it. Shell Horowitz, uh, thanks again for being with us. Well, Z, uh, there you go. Uh, you know, this. You know, people talk about touchy feely, but there's really a basis <laughs> of knowledge for this, and there are, as he pointed out, you know, major corporations that are turning. Uh, this this newfound attitude, whether they were shamed into it or not, into profit. Yeah, and and also what I found uh, interesting because you you and I have talked about this too is that even if uh, there was no such thing as climate change or global warming, uh, the stuff that we would do to prevent global warming uh, would be beneficial to not only society but but the economy as well. So, you know, again, to have that that um, that idea reconfirmed uh, by someone who's deep in this uh, was was gratifying, to say the least. Well, again, uh, Shell is one of the hardest working uh, people that I know. And, you know, he when, as I said, when he when he writes about something, it's either firsthand or he brings somebody into the fold that does have firsthand knowledge. And so, you know, you give them a lot of a lot of credit for that. There are there are really no shortcuts in his world. And you know, see, at, at the end of the day, as as I said during our conversation uh, with Shell, for, for lefties like us, you know, a book like uh, Guerrilla Marketing Heal, Heal the World is really a wonderful affirmation to what we already believe in. But I think it's also an opportunity for those that would love to, uh, you know, have a knowledge base. God forbid we'd have a knowledge base, but would have a knowledge base in order to confront people that don't believe in climate change or do not believe in socially responsible business practice. And these are the things that really will drive a new economy. You know, and listening to a great program on NPR as I was out driving around last night, you know, Bernie Sanders' carbon tax is an example, uh, really is uh, an effort to get all of us, whether you drive a car or you own a major Fortune 50 corporation, to reduce their carbon footprint. These are the kind of ideas whose time has come. Yeah, well... Yeah, that should have come a long time ago. I mean, as as Shell pointed out, right? If all of these the building boom in the '80s, if it had done, been done sustainably, uh, we might not be in as grave a situation as we are now. Now, there's no uh, question that is true. Well, that brings us to the end of the day. If you can believe that, that went by awfully fast. Um, Crazy. So. As I ask every day, how can we get more information about TNZ Talk? Well, as usual, on the intertubes uh, at tnztalk.com. I, lo I love it when you say that. <laughs> I just love it when you say that. Don't know where that came from, but I love it when you say it. The intertubes and the interwebs. So on the intertubes yeah. at, t at tnztalk.com, you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, everything you need to know about us, our bios, and of course our archives. And if you go to our support page, it'll take you to the many ways that you can support us, both financially and through ratings and um, reviews on iTunes. We recently just got accepted to Google and we're working on Spotify. So that's it, tnztalk.com. Yeah, and for the person that sent me an email last night, uh, the Google thing isn't up and running yet, but that's not because of us. It's because of Google. And as soon as they open the floodgates, we will let you know. We'll be first in line. All right. That'll do it for us for today. I want to thank, of course, Richard Zombeck, Shell Horowitz, our guest today. 
uh, Ron Spikes, Rihanna, and everybody else at Blog Talk USA for giving us the opportunity to do this on a daily basis. A quick uh, programming note. Uh, beginning on Monday, the show will be moving to 10 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so make a note of that. And for those of you that listen via podcast or archive, well, I guess it just doesn't matter, does it? I'm Tony Truppiano. Have a great Wednesday. We'll be back on Thursday. And as always, we ask that you be well. Oh, yeah. Can you feel it? Just over the credits, just riffing now. Words and chords. Not the poetry and the real thing, but not bad for an ad lib. Not good, but... It's not long enough, so just do a little bit more. And that's nearly done. That's the final credit there. That's the end.